Do you have your Bible with you? I hope that you do. Open your Bible to the book of Philippians tonight. The book of Philippians tonight is what we're going to be talking about. And, and I want you to know that I'm excited about opening the Bible tonight to the book of Philippians uh, coming up in August. Uh, I will be having the privilege to go to the land of Haiti and we're going to be uh, doing a crusade over in Haiti. Uh, we're going to be doing a crusade at night and we're going to be doing a Bible teaching in the day. And they've asked us to come and share uh, the book of Philippians with them. Now I want to tell you a little bit, uh, not, not y'all, but I want to tell you a little bit different uh, things we're going to see different when we go to Haiti. Uh, when we go to Haiti, the first thing that we're going to notice is going to be a packed out place. Uh, there's going to be people standing all around. They're going to be outside. Uh, and man, when I say take your Bible and open it up, they're going to dig in. And they're going to they're going to they're going to be interested in what is being said. So tonight, I don't want you to let our Haitian friends uh, put you to shame. Tonight, I want you to open your Bible to the book of Philippians, and we're going to learn together. Can I get an amen? And we're going to study together. So let's open it up to book of Philippians chapter 1 uh, while you're turning there. Uh, as I begin to study and prepare myself to go to the land of Haiti, uh, I started uh, studying and... Uh, as I started studying the book of Philippians, I noticed that there was something uh, that was common in the book of Philippians. As a matter of fact, uh, the book of Philippians have a lot, it has a lot of commonality uh, as you study that book. Uh, you'll note that it is an epistle given by the great apostle Paul, and it's given to the church in Philippi. And there's a lot of history there, but if you want to write down three things that, uh, that just kind of rises to the top, uh, about the book of Philippians, you may want to write this down. The first thing that rises to the top in the book of Philippians is Christian joy. Uh, that is, we are to have the joy of the Lord. Uh, we're to be the most joyful people on planet Earth. Now, I'm not talking about giddy. Uh, I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about you ought to have God's joy inside you. Can I get an amen? Uh, you ought to be a joyful person. You say, Brother Jackie, I don't have a lot to be joyful about. Well, let me tell you something. You really do if you know Jesus, amen. Uh, because you've got the joy of the Lord. You've got the, the joy of the hope of eternity. We've got the joy of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've got the joy that passes our, even our comprehension. We've got the joy of knowing, Brother Gary, when we, go, when we leave this earth, we're going to go to heaven. Can I get an amen? We've got the joy of serving God. Uh, we've got the joy of singing. We've got the joy of praying. We've got the joy of worship. Uh, we've got the joy, joy, joy where? Y'all are so good, y'all, down in my heart. And it's down in my heart to stay. And, and we need to know that. So if you were to look at the book of Philippians, you could say, Brother Jackie, the book of Philippians is a book uh, that reminds us that we are to be joyful Christians. So, so that rises to the top. The other thing that rises to the top when you begin to study the book of Philippians is that we are to have love for one another. We ought to love each other. Uh, you know, we ought to love each other all the time. We ought to be a, a place uh, where people come in and feel the love of God. Can I get an amen? Uh, Jesus said, you are to love each other because I loved you. Uh, you know, you are to let the love of God re re just, just ooze through you. Uh, you are to love one another. And, and I think that churches that have joy and churches that show godly love is the churches people want to attend. I believe that people, listen guys, how many of y'all are saved in here tonight? Amen. Are you saved? Say amen. amen. Are, you, are you saved? Say praise the, Lord. praise the Lord. Then you ought to have joy. You ought to have the love of God inside you. The Bible says that you ought to let the love of God be shed abroad in your heart. And men, we ought to be a people that loves Jesus and loves each other. Look at the person sitting beside you and say, I love you because God loves you. Amen. God loves you. Amen. <clears throat> now, if you don't have nobody, <clears throat> if you don't have nobody to tell that to tonight, uh, you needed to brought a visitor with you tonight. Amen. But but you need to be able to love one another. Let, let's just do it a little bit different. Are y'all ready? Uh, y'all look too comfortable on this rainy Sunday night. So so let's all stand to our feet for a minute. Everybody stand up. This is uh this is spiritual calisthenics tonight. So uh, here we go, everybody. Everybody say, I got the joy of the Lord. Come on, let's say it together. I got the joy of the Lord. 
and, and just wave at everybody in this place and say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Amen. You know what? Uh, Y'all didn't do real good at that love thing, uh, real good. Let's do it again. I got the joy of the Lord. Now wave at everybody and say, I really love you. I really love you. I really love you. I really love you. Amen. I love you. I love you. Now, now, while you're standing, there is a third uh, thing that rises to the top in the book of Philippians. You know what it is? Maturity. We ought to grow up. We ought to grow up. How many of you understand that when you grow up, you get stabilized? Or at least you're supposed to. Uh, we're supposed to be stabilized in our faith. And I, while you're standing together tonight, let's bow one more time and put your hand over your heart. And just say to God out loud, Lord, give me your joy. Lord, teach me to love. Teach me to love others. Teach me to love you. And teach me to love myself. And help me to mature. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Isn't that good? Didn't that feel good, y'all? Amen. That felt good. You open your Bible as we talk about tonight the marks of maturity. When I begin to study the book of Philippians, I begin to write on the marks of maturity and I begin to quickly realize that on Sunday night and even a week long in Haiti, I would not have the time uh, to talk about what is the marks of maturity because, Brother Randy, there are so many. There's so many that just rises to the top uh, in the book of Philippians. As a matter of fact, the more I studied, uh, frankly, the more aggravated I got. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, uh, I've got to narrow this down and I'm going to have to leave out a lot. And so uh, when I began to prepare for the land of Haiti, I was going, I'm so frustrated because I, now I'm thinking, you know what, I don't need to be there a week. I need to be there like a long time to teach these people what is Christian maturity. And I believe that it is really a thought that all of us could say yes and amen, that we need an overdose of that. Uh, we need our churches overdosed with maturity. Uh, now, I want you to remember this. Just because you get mature doesn't mean you get sour. Uh, you know, people go, well, I'm mature. You look like you've been sucking a dill pickle. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about that. I, I'm not talking about just because you get mature that you get grouchy or ornery. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, I believe that when you grow up as a Christian, that the, I think there's something that happens to your countenance. I, I don't believe that you get sour. I don't believe you get uh, ornery. I believe the glow of God gets in you. And I believe that the more you mature and the more you become like Jesus, the more of the countenance of Christ you show in your life. I believe that when you get joy in your life, the countenance change. When you get the love of God, your countenance change. And I believe that the more you grow, the more you mature, the more of the countenance of Jesus you ought to have in your life. And I believe that the countenance of Jesus is a very attractive countenance. I don't believe that Jesus would be on this earth and be mean. I just don't believe that. I don't believe he would uh, be on this earth and be bitter. I don't believe he would be unapproachable. I believe that he would be the person that everybody would want to hang out with. Would you agree with that? The Bible gives evidence of that, that multitudes followed him. So when I begin to study and I begin to examine the word of God, I begin to say, okay, where is the starting point of maturity after you are saved? So tonight I'm going to give you just a couple things of, to write down and then we're just going to kind of build on it as we go along. So let's open our Bible to the book of Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 1 and 2. Are you with me? Let's look there together. Open your Bible up. Uh, I know it's on the screen, but I want you to open it up tonight uh, for us to talk about. When you begin to look in chapter 1 and verse number 1 and verse number 2, there is a mountain of information in just those two verses. And the more uh, that I begin to exegete those verses, the more I, I'm going, God, uh, this is just a mountain of, of word that we need to get in our spirit. But you may say, Pastor, there's only two verses there. But the more I dug in, the more I'm going, oh my goodness. Uh, this, these two verses are filled with the richness of God that would be distributed in our life to be mature. So I want you to look there in chapter 1, verse number 1 and 2. 
Would you all read it with me as we read out loud together? Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at with the bishops and the deacons. Let's read verse 2 with a lot of enthusiasm. Are you ready? Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at those two verses, you may say, Brother Jackie, that is, that's what's known as a salutation. Uh, that is the opening of the letter uh, that Paul is writing to the church of Philippi. What in, what in this world would get you so jazzed about that? Why would you get so excited about an introduction? Well, when I begin to pray about this and begin to dig in, God began to just magnify some things out. I mean, when I, when I, I mean right now, y'all, seriously, I look at this and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, there's just a mountain of stuff just flowing life from the Word of God to my spirit. Uh, when I look at that, it's almost as if I look at this and, and I don't know why or how, that I could describe it to you, but it's almost like there's just so much meat flowing out of this word into my spirit, man, that would cause me to go, wow, this is rich and deep. So when we look there together, I'm gonna, I wanted to put down a few things that, that may help you and help me as well. So let's go back and let's look at point number one in the outline. And that is this, when you look at point number one in your outline, if you'll just go ahead and flip the screen there, uh, we talk about slaves. Now, uh, I've been reading my daily Bible reading, and Denise and I were talking about it the other day. How many of y'all are doing Fill the Void? I mean, really. Uh, you're doing Fill the Void with our, with our daily Bible reading. I'm so proud of you guys for doing that. Thank God for that. Well, let me tell you what I do e every year, okay? So you'll kind of know how I track uh, with, with my, my uh, I try to do something that's a little bit different uh, than, than just studying for sermons. I, you know, I have to study for sermons. I have to write a lot. And I have to read a lot. And man, you know, I do that to, because I know Sunday's coming, whether I like it or not. But one of the things I do in my own personal life is I have my daily Bible reading for me personally. And uh, the way I do this, and you may want to th think about this in your life, uh, one year I read through Fill the Void. Uh, you know, I read uh, the same thing all of you are reading. The next year, I choose to read a chronological Bible. In other words, I, I, I read one year like you guys are reading. The next year, I have a chronological Bible that is uh, dedicated to a one-year reading chronologically. And I will read uh, through the chronological Bible every other year. And I've been doing that for a long time. So I'll read the... Bible like y'all reading, just regular Genesis through Revelation one year, and then the next year I'll alternate to the chronological reading. And this year, I'm reading the chronological Bible. I'm reading that every day, just getting the Word of God in my spirit and in my soul. And I was reading about the slaves uh, just this week. And when you read about the slaves, you begin to realize that there's a lot of laws that are given about the slaves. And I won't get into all that, but... There, when you read your Bible, there's just a mountain of information about slaves. Now, when Paul, if you'll notice in chapter 1 and verse number 1, Paul says that him and Timothy are servants. Underline that in your Bible. They're servants. And, and uh, we'll, we'll look at 1 Corinthians in just a moment. But when you look there, you begin to realize that in the Greek, the translation of that word servant is the word bond slave. Uh, and when you look at that as the Greek word doulos, which means a bond slave, and, and, and there's a lot to talk about with that. But really what they're saying is Paul gives no, uh, there is no wonder, there is no guessing who he and Timothy have become a slave to. He immediately says, Paul and Timothy, a slave of Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm not my master anymore. I, I don't own me anymore. I, I've been bought with a price. Can I get an amen? Uh, for those of you that's been on the Wednesday night Bible study, you will remember uh, that we've been talking about this on Wednesday night, and I love this teaching, and my goodness, Brother Rick and I were talking earlier. Uh, I'm just going to tell you, I could just stay there and talk about that for months and years. 
about the Abrahamic covenant and how God has redeemed us. And you remember, for those of you that's been in the Bible study on Wednesday night, redemption is an interesting word concerning our life as believers. What does it mean? Does anybody remember? Uh, we've been purchased in the slave market. Uh, we've been purchased out of the slave market, and we've been freed. That's what God does for us. God finds us as slaves to sin. We are a slave to sin. Now, you may say, Brother Jack, I'm, I was not. Yes, you was. You was a slave to sin. And you were on the slave market in sin, and all of a sudden you couldn't rescue yourself. And God walked up and paid a redemptive price to set you free. And the Bible tells us that Jesus has redeemed us by his precious blood. Can I get an amen? So what does Jesus do? He finds us on the slave market of sin, and he purchases us with his blood. Because of that, we become his slave. We become a bond slave, a servant of Jesus Christ. I've learned in my own personal life, y'all, that you will never mature as a believer if you do not give up your rights to yourself. Amen. You have to give up the rights to your own agenda and your own self. You know, all of a sudden, your whole, your whole thought process changes. It's not about you anymore. It's not about your agenda. It's not about your life. It's not about your comfort. It's not about your plans. It's not about your purpose anymore. You don't belong to you no more. You belong to him. And when you belong to him, you serve him. Can I get an amen? Now, this is the way people do. They go, well, you know what, Brother Jackie? I served him Sunday morning last month. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. You know what you do? Remember this. You serve Jesus every second of every day. By, by the way, going to church is not an obligation. It's a privilege. You know, you, you serve God every day. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says these words, you're bought with a price. Therefore, you are to glorify God in your body. You're bought with a price. How many of you know that you are bought with a price? And that price was a very expensive one. Let me go on record to tell you this. I wasn't worth a whole lot when Jesus found me. And by the way, you weren't either. Can I get an Amen. But how many of you know the King of kings and the Lord of lords was worth a lot? We were bought with a price, his blood. And he made us worth something because of that. We're bought into his family and we're bought with a price. Therefore, we're to glorify God in our body. And the next part of that verse says, and you're in your spirit, which is God's. In other words, when you become a Christian, you belong to him. And you are to serve him. That's why Paul said, Man, me and Timothy, we're slaves to Jesus. Now, the next scripture is profound to me, and this is what it says. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, come on now, as silver and gold, come on, from your vain conversation received by traditions from your father. But this next part, read it out loud, everybody. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Can we just give God praise for that tonight? We were bought with a price because of that. You know what? The least I could do, the least I could do is serve him. The least I could do is say, you're my master. The least I could do is give him my life. And when I think about that, I remember that Paul and Timothy were servants of Jesus. Can I ask you something? Will you be honest? You're in church, you're supposed to be. How many of you in this building can honestly say that God has bought you with the precious blood of Jesus? Can I get an amen? Here's the next question. Are you serving him with everything? Are you serving him with everything? Are you, are you glorifying God in your body and your spirit? Or have you sold out? Have you signed on the dotted line to say, Lord, I belong to you. And whatever you need for me to do, I will do it. Is there anybody in here that would say that you would be willing to do that? Don't raise your hand. What if he asked you 
to sell everything you got and go on the foreign mission field? What if he called you to preach? What if he said to you, I want you to give up your life and I want you to serve me and I want you to be a pastor. I want you to be in ministry. Would you do it? What if he said to you, I want you to, I want you to give up all the worldly stuff and I want you to commit your life to me. Would you do that? Would you do that? Would you, would, you, would you say, Lord, could you say this? All to thee, I surrender. All to thee, I freely give. I surrender all. You know, it's so easy to be in church and get all excited about it. Talk about, oh man, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're great and everything's good. But I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me. It's a whole lot different when God puts his hand on you and says, I chose you now. I chose you. Uh, you know, I, I want you to do this. I want you to step out and surrender your life. Young man, I'm calling you to surrender ministry. You thought you was going to be an engineer, but that changed all that. I'm calling you to serve me. I'm calling you to be a missionary to the school. I'm calling you to do that. Would you do that? Would you say to God, God, I'm your servant. It's easy when God, remember what I'm about to tell you. Write this down. It's easy to amen when God is bothering somebody else. Can I get an amen? It's just so easy to amen when God's bothering somebody else. But when he's bothering you, that's where the rubber meets the road. Can I get an amen? Well, I've got y'all under conviction so much, we better move to point number two. <clears throat> All right? What is a saint? Paul says to all the saints. Now, in my book, you only got one of two choices. You're either a saint or a haint. <clears throat> and I don't believe you want to be a haint. What is a saint? What does that mean? If you are a child of God, you are a saint. You say, well, I don't think I've made it there. Yeah, you have. If you're a child of God, what that means is you've been set apart from the world. You are a saint. Uh, I know you're looking at the person beside you thinking, really? But they're a saint if they know Jesus. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a saint. You're a saint. Tell, tell Kevin, Leanne. Tell him. <laughs> tell him, Leanne. You're a saint. Um, you know, if you know Jesus, you're a saint. You're set apart. Well, how does that work? Now, I'm going to give you three things, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to elaborate a lot on it, but I want to give you three things about it. It means that you are sanctified. Sanctified. To be set apart means that you're sanctified. I love the way Paul says to all the saints in Christ Jesus. And guess what, guys? Watch this. <clears throat> he didn't say to all the saints in Philippi. He didn't say to all the saints in Colossae or Thessalonica. He said to all the saints that are in Christ Jesus which so happened to be in the church at Philippi. So if Paul were to walk into our church tonight, he would say, hey, Timothy and I are servants of Jesus Christ, and we want to speak to all the saints here at Eden Westside Baptist Church. And you would, you would think, what does that mean? It means you're sanctified. Now, sanctified seems to be a dignified word, but I want to give you a couple of things to think about. When you come to know Christ, you are positionally sanctified. You are positionally sanctified. In other words, you become born again and you are placed in Christ. And because of that, you're not who you used to be. Can I get an amen? Because you're in Christ. Hebrews 3, 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the holy calling, Consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession who is Jesus Christ. 
Notice he calls them holy brethren, saints, set apart. In the next verse it says uh, in Hebrews 10.10, 10, by the which we will, we are what? Sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus. How often? Once and for all. How many of you realize when you're in Christ, it's a done deal? Can I get an amen? Aren't you glad that God don't kick you out when you mess up? Can I get an amen? Aren't you glad that God doesn't disown you when you sin? Thank God for that. Amen. Because I'm so thankful that our Father has set us apart in His Son. We are positionally sanctified. But we are progressively being sanctified. We are progressively, next point, we are progressively being sanctified. That means that we're being sanctified every day, every minute of every day. There's an old song that says, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. Somebody tell me. He's still working on me. Progressive sanctification means that God is constantly working on you. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you are not who you used to be? Can I get an amen? How many of you, I look at this congregation and I look at y'all and I could just squeeze some of y'all. I, I love y'all. I see where you've been and where you are. And I'm so proud of y'all. Man, because you're not who you used to be. God has changed you. God is not finished with you, but God is changing you. I look around this congregation, man, and I, I'm telling you, man, I feel like a proud daddy. My chest just pokes out and I go, man, thank God I see God at work in your life. I mean, think about this. Some, for some of you, a year ago, two years ago, do you think you'd be sitting in church on Sunday night? Listening to some preacher preach? No. That wouldn't, that wouldn't be your choice, but here you are. And you're hungry and you're, you're singing and you're worshiping and you're getting filled with the presence of God. God's brought you a long way. Can I get an amen? amen. And I thank God for that. John 17, 17 says these words, sanctify them through thy truth. Now watch this. Somebody tell me the last part. Thy word is truth. You want to become more sanctified? Get in the word. Get in the word. Get, get in the word of God. And the more the word of God that gets in you, the more sanctified you become. So if you want to get deeper with God, get in the word more. The Bible tells us in the next verse, it says, and the very God of peace will sanctify you holy. What does that mean? I pray God for your whole body. Uh, stay with me. Spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. You know what? God wants to work on us all the way, our body, soul, and spirit. He wants to set us apart, change us, sanctify us, make sure that we're growing in him. So that's progressive sanctification. And then you'll notice in the next part of that, it says, faithful is he that called you, and he will what? Do it. Look at me and listen to me. God don't give up on us. Can I get an amen? You know, I just look at Christy. I'm so proud of you, Christy. I love you. You know, Christy, Christy's come a long way, y'all. God's doing a work in Christy's life. Amen. And I look at, here she is at church on Sunday night. Can we just say we love her? Yes. And we just thank God. Crystal, where are you, Crystal? Look at that. This girl, man, God, Crystal, can I just brag on you? Is it all right if I brag on you, Crystal? Say, yeah, Brother Jack. <laughs> Crystal's come a long way, y'all. I mean, God's working on her. Hadn't give up on you, Crystal. He loves you. Can I get an amen from the balcony? We love you, Crystal. God's doing things, y'all. He don't quit on us. Can I get an amen? amen. And guys, he's not going to let you go. He's going to keep on working on you and grow you, mature you, and develop you. And Watch this, Crystal. Watch this, Christy. He's making something beautiful with you. Can I get an amen? He's making something beautiful with you. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? Once God gets a hold of you, he ain't going to let you go. Praise God. Can I get an amen? It's an amen place. And then one day, and this is where we all shout amen, 
We're going to be permanently sanctified. How many of y'all looking forward to that day? When we get to heaven, you know, we, we, we're permanently set apart. And how many of y'all know it ain't as long as it has been? Amen. I mean, I look at some of y'all. Y'all getting closer by the second. Good night. You know, we just, we're just getting there, man. What if one, day, one day we're going to meet him. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 27, that he may present us to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, that he would do that. And the next part of that says, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. How in the world can we do that? We can't do that by ourselves. It's Jesus in us. The next verse says these words, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. Hallelujah. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Oh, but listen. Say this with me, everybody. But we know that when he shall appear... Lord, y'all give me bad to cost up in this place. Anybody know what I'm talking about? When he's going to appear, we're going to be like him. Can I get an amen, y'all? Is there anybody say praise the Lord for that day, y'all? God's good, y'all. We're going to be like him. Amen. The old things are passed away. God is going to make everything new. Man, I can't wait for that, y'all. And God's doing a work in us. And because of that, we're saints. But not only does God tell us we're saints, but he calls us holy. Now that scares me, y'all. Kind of rattles my cage a little bit. Uh, and I have to ask myself, how you doing in that compartment, Brother Jackie? This holiness thing. You know, I, I have to be honest with you. That, that's, a, that's a work that I, I look at and I go, man, I could get jazzed up about being sanctified. But this holy thing, I, I don't know about y'all, but I have to make a confession to you. If holiness was dependent upon me, I'd probably have a failing grade. Y'all don't look at me like that. Y'all be worse than me, man. Uh, you know, good night. I look at this and I think, good grief. But 1 Peter 1.13 tells us what to do. In that scripture, it says these words. If you'll flip over there, it says, uh, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober, be, be sober. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 14 says, And as obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of your life. The Bible goes on and says, Because it is written, everybody let's say this together, Be ye holy. Why? You know, I look at that and I go, God, really? How can I be holy? Well, guys, you know what? We can't in our flesh. We can only be holy because of the one that we're in. The Bible says this, and boy, I think it just means, that scripture, I think it just means that we're supposed to live our life before people so they can see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Doesn't mean we've got to be perfect, but it does mean that we ought to have a life change. It does mean that the more we mature, the better choices we make. The more we grow in Christ, the closer we get to Him. The Bible says you're also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. What are we, y'all? A holy priesthood. And the next part of that says we are to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I don't know about y'all, but I want to be more holy in my life. Do you? I hope you do. And then servants. He uses the term servants for us in that next part. Servants is workers of the ministry. You know, I believe that we ought to serve the Lord. And I want you to write this down because we're going to say it together. It's fun to serve Jesus. Can I get an amen? Did y'all write that down? We're going to say it together. It's fun to serve Jesus. I was telling somebody today, you know, I just assume for people not to do anything than for them to do it and gripe about it. You know, if you're going to do something and gripe about it, you know, I just don't think it's worth it. I think you need to serve Jesus because you think it's a good thing to serve him. And I think that it ought to be fun to serve Jesus. 
And, and I, I believe that we ought to do that with the right spirit, the right attitude. I was bragging on OTJ yesterday. Uh, you know, OTJ over there, he's old bald-headed drummer. He tries to look like he's got hair, but it's falling out quickly. <laughs> and I was bragging on OTJ yesterday. I love that boy. I do love you. And I said, you know what? T I watch TJ. I, I watch everybody that serves in this church. I really do. I watch how people serve. And I watch TJ, and TJ plays the drums for both services on Sunday morning and Sunday night. And I'm just telling you, he's a happy drummer. I believe if I said to TJ, TJ, I want you to go climb that tree over yonder and just sing glory, hallelujah. He had put a smile on his face and say, yes, sir, pastor. And I believe he'd do it with a joy in his heart. Thank you for serving God that way. I, I look at Dewey. Dewey, I love you, man. Dewey, Dewey just serves God, does whatever. He just, whatever we want him to do, he, he just does it. Him and Vicky showed up this week, and I just got to tell you, y'all just blessed us. You know, they showed up to church this week and made spaghetti for the whole staff Wednesday. I mean, I just ate like a pig. And, and old, Dewey, old Dewey and Vicky made uh, spaghetti for all the staff. It just said, we just want to come in and show y'all we love you and appreciate you. Can I tell you what Dewey did? Dewey, y'all ever go to a restaurant and get salad and the leaves are as big as you are? I don't like salad like that. Oh, Dewey broke every piece of salad up bite size. Dewey, to God be the glory. You know, and I thought, I don't have to worry about uh, finding a big old leaf in my salad. I thought at one time he had already chewed it up for us. But I was thinking, man, he serves God that way. Thank you. All the people that serve at the River Campus. You know, I just got to tell you that, guys, is, that's unconventional. It ain't easy serving there in that capacity. It ain't easy doing all that they do and having to be on a time limit. Uh, Brother Rick is watching songs to sing and clocks to monitor and listening to people and getting messages all at the same time, all those people. I don't know how you do it, brother. But I tell you what, we've been serving together for a long time, and I love his spirit serving the Lord. He's never one time griped to me. Don't start now, Brother Rick. He's never one time complained. Thank God for people like that. We're serving God. It's fun to serve Jesus. Can I get an amen? Romans chapter 6 and verse 17 and 18 says this, but God be thanked. We were servants of sin, y'all. Did you hear that? We were servants of sin. But you have obeyed from the heart that from the doctrine which was delivered unto you. Being then made free from sin, we became servants of righteousness. Can I get an amen? I want to tell you all, look at me. One time I served the devil real good. And you was too. And you was too. And you was too. But thank God for, for the Calvary's cross. Now we get to be servants of righteousness. To God be the glory. Can we just give him praise in this place tonight? He's so good. So come on, guys. What's the benefits of growing up? What's the benefits of maturing? Well, I wrote these down in the bottom line. It goes like this. You get grace. You know, it's, it's good to serve God and grow up because you get grace. But not only do you get grace, you get peace. Uh, you know, I just don't, I don't think that I'd be satisfied with my life if I wasn't serving Jesus. If I wasn't serving Jesus, I don't think I'd be happy. I don't think I'd have any peace in my life. The more I serve Him, the more fulfilled I am. The more of me I give away, the more thankful I am of Him that He fills me. Because I'm a firm believer, we've said it a million times, you can't outgive God. 
A lot of times when we think about that, we think about money. But I don't believe you can outgive him with your life. I believe the more you give away, the more God will put in you. And I want to thank you tonight, congregation of Eden West Side. You give a lot. There are people in this building that give a lot. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for serving Christ here. Thank you for giving your life away. Thank you, sound people and media people and musicians and teachers and leaders and people that serve and give their life. Thank you for that. Because I know you do that because you love it. Tonight, I want us to bow for a minute. Maybe tonight you need to start off by giving your heart to Christ. Saying to the Lord, Lord, take my life. If you'd like to give Jesus your life tonight, I want you to stand up right where you're sitting and say, God, I want to give you my life. I want to invite you into my heart, my, my life. This is your chance to say, Lord, come into my heart, come into my life. You may be here tonight and you say, Brother Jackie, I want to be a member here. If that's your desire, why don't you stand up where you are and just say, I want to be a member of this church. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed tonight, we started off by putting our hand over our heart. Can we, can we close tonight by doing the same thing? Just put our hand over our heart and just say this to God. Father, I give you my life. I totally surrender myself to you. Whatever you want to do with my life, I offer my life to you. I surrender all. To God be the glory. Can I get an amen? Let's give God praise tonight. He is good. Amen. The Lord is good. Brother Randy, thank you guys. I know you had just as I am prepared, and that's great. I appreciate that. But tonight was more of a personal thing between you and God. Tonight, I wanted to close tonight's service by celebrating each one reach one. Um, each one reach one is our special discipleship program that we've designed here at our church uh, for someone to take somebody along the journey for 52 weeks and pour into their life uh, the Each One Reach One curriculum that we have. And uh, tonight we're celebrating some people that have lived out our church's discipleship plan. We've asked our members to invest in the life of someone else. Investment comes to fruition when you earn the right to invite your friend to accept Jesus as your Savior and then celebrate their baptism with joy. After this, we asked you to ignite your friend in discipleship for 30 minutes every week for 52 weeks. Tonight, we celebrate these people that have journeyed through our church's discipleship too called Each One Reach One, and they've reached the end of their 52 weeks. I like the following to come to the stage with me and join me on the stage because I want to celebrate your accomplishment. Uh, Brother Tim O'Connor, you and Willie Harris, will y'all come? Just come on up. Spend this time together. Come on up here with me, guys. Reva and Melanie, y'all come on up. Adita and Michelle, y'all come on up. Aida and Michelle, come on up. And Denise, my wife, uh, is supposed to be with uh, Michelle Ham. Michelle's sick, and Michelle couldn't make it tonight. And tonight, we want to celebrate a very special time with you. So uh, you guys come on up here by me and hang out with me. For 52 weeks, these people, Tim has met with Willie and Reva has met with Michelle and uh, Aida, huh? Melody. And uh, Aida has met with uh, Melanie, Michelle. <laughs> They're sisters, man. I get them all mixed up. I'm just kidding with you. And y'all been through the discipleship program. And uh, so tonight, we want to celebrate with you. So, Steph... We would like to give you all a certificate, a certificate of completion 
And Brother Tim, this is Each One Reach One, the Ignite Award that we'd like to present to you in recognition of completing Each One Reach One, the year-long discipleship plan of Eden Westside Baptist Church. So Brother Tim, I'd like to give that to you. Willie, I'd like to present this to you, that you've been uh, able to finish the task that uh, Brother Tim has poured into your life. I've come by the hall and watched y'all in the rooms, and you can't even imagine what that has done for me. Reva, I'd like to, no, Aida, I'd like to present this to you. Thank you for giving your life away and sharing your life with a very special person that we love very much. Michelle, we love you. You have grown so much. It's amazing to me what God is doing with your life. Uh, this girl has come and got saved and joined the church, and now she runs all of our uh, media presentations at the River Campus, y'all. It's amazing what God does with you, and I appreciate that. Reba, words can never tell you how much I love you. You was one of the very first ones that said to me when we started the River Campus, Brother Jackie, I'll help you. And you've been faithful, and I love you. Just so happened you got married and moved away, and I don't like that. But uh, we love you. You're a very special person to, to us. And Melanie, we thank you. You have demonstrated to me what it means to get saved and grow and mature. And uh, from the first time I ever met you, I loved you. And I thank God for you. And uh, I just want to thank all of you for following through with the Each One Reach One Discipleship Program. I was excited the other day uh, when Tim was talking about finishing with uh, Willie. And now Willie is going to be starting with Marcus, a new believer in Christ, uh, to disciple him. And so, you know what? That's, that's what it's all about. So can, can we just say to all these folks, thank you guys. Let's just stand up and give them a round of applause for what they've done. Thank you all so much for doing that. I love you. What am I doing? What is it? I heard y'all. Y'all were y'all y'all was doing an hour or two hours, but while you're while you're standing up, we're gonna close in just a moment. But from the bottom of my heart, y'all, uh, this is what I've saw, Brother Rick. I've saw that Tim, because you've done that with Willie, he hadn't he hadn't dropped out. You know, we have people that come in the church and get saved, and two weeks later the FBI can't find them. And looky here. Here are people, here's living examples, y'all, of how it works. They are sticking, y'all. You want to know how to close the back door? That's how you do it. That's how you do it. So I salute you, my brothers and my sisters. I love you. Thank you for serving the Lord with me. I love you. God bless you. Amen. We're going to close. We're going to close with prayer. I was thinking about this today, and this is my challenge to all of you. I would love for everybody in this building to start a new life discovery class with one person. Everybody here gets to start a class with one person. Find you somebody that you can introduce them to Jesus and disciple them. Can you imagine what would happen in our church if everybody started a discipleship class with somebody that you lead to Jesus. I'm on week 49 with my guy. I can't wait. Just a couple more weeks, we celebrate our year. And I'm excited about what God is doing. So tonight, thank you, I love you. Would you be my guest and go to the back door and greet everybody tonight? They want to come my love on y'all. If they don't love on you, you tell me. Y'all go to the back door tonight. Y'all congratulate these people as uh, y'all go, y'all go. Um, y'all greet everybody out there go, go to the front door you're our guest of honor tonight y'all go to the back door and say hello to everybody and, and y'all love on them congratulate them Father in the name of Jesus we come before you tonight we thank you Lord that we can grow and mature in you we thank you God that you love us and you sustain us and you grow us we thank you that we are called the servants of the most high God in Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said, amen. God's good, y'all. Amen.